Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose Online. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning for our service. Uh, our prayer is that you will hear the voice of God speaking to your heart, challenging you, comforting you, encouraging you, helping you in this journey that we call life. And in doing so, uh, in just a moment, we're going to be heading into a time of worship, which I truly believe is a time of preparation for our hearts, minds, and ears to receive the Word of God. But before we do that, uh, I just invite you to check in with us, take your cell phone, and text to this number, 408 547 4911. 408 547 4911. And this is our way of checking in and finding out who's joining us online and your opportunity to reach out to us with any questions, concerns, uh, if you need any help, if you need prayer. This is the number to, to text to us and we would love to connect with you. So if you've never uh, text to that number before, text the word connect and then follow the prompts and please fill out all that information uh, with your name and address, email, phone number, all that, just so that we know how to connect with you as you are learning how to connect with us. If you've texted that number before, we encourage you to text your first name and the word here. This way we get an idea of, of who is joining us. We also get an idea of, um, of how we might be able to come alongside and, and serve you. Uh, at this time, I want to remind you that we are still collecting donations for our Cards of Love, which we use to support uh, five of our local schools this year to be able to help families in need during the time of Thanksgiving. We will be giving them a $60 gift card and an opportunity for them to purchase food during that special holiday season. Uh, we are almost halfway. We've raised a little over $1,300 of our goal of over $3,000 to purchase all the gift cards. If you have yet to, uh, to help us, if you have yet to donate, would you please consider uh, at least one of the gift cards, that's $60. If you can do more than that, we greatly appreciate your generosity, your help and support for families during this time of the year. We appreciate you and we thank you in advance for your help and support of that. We're going to uh, go ahead and, and head right into worship. Would you just allow the Holy Spirit to encourage you today to uh, just bring you to a place uh, where you're ready to to hear his word. God bless you, and we'll see you after worship. Thank you. Thank you. 
back everyone i trust and pray that your time of worship was um, instrumental in helping you uh, prepare your hearts today to hear and receive the word of god um, i'm just really excited about this series that we have been doing for the last coming into this week the six weeks just talking about heroes of the faith and not biblical heroes of the faith but heroes of the faith that lived after the bible was written. And so uh, we have been talking about some great men and women of God who, whose relationship with God shaped and changed and helped them navigate their culture and their times uh, as they were just striving to be obedient to the Word of God. Um, if I ask you who your heroes are, I'm sure there would be a lot of uh, ideas of sports and music, uh, people that have personally influenced you either through work or your family. Uh, many people would point to their, one of their parents or to a grandparent, uh, maybe a peer or a sibling. 
Um, but today I want to talk about the, um, the influence of, of others in our lives that we may not have a chance to meet personally, but we've read their stories or we have heard about them in such a way that they have impacted our life and, and makes us want to, um, to imitate or be like them, which is what the Bible says, is, which, is what the, uh, the impact that somebody should have on us is somebody who is worth the influence of following. And that's found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. This is what we've been talking about for the last uh, six weeks is how we can find someone's life that is worth imitating. And um, through the preparation of these various messages over the course of the past six weeks, um, I have learned how people, just like you and me, have overcome the challenges and the setbacks and, and the oppositions found in life and how they have learned how to walk out their faith in the most remarkable ways under the most overwhelming and difficult odds of their culture and of their setting. We have talked about Martin Luther and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Elizabeth Elliot, Bruce Olson, Florence Nightingale, and today we're going to be talking about, um, uh, her name is Isabella Bom, uh, Bomfrey, but we know her as Sojourner Truth. And she has an amazing story of redemption and of forgiveness. And I just love how God used her in such a miraculous way. Uh, she was a former slave who became an outspoken advocate for abolition and temperance and civil and women's rights in the 19th century when it wasn't kosher to do so. Uh, she bucked all kinds of odds and all kinds of systems uh, in order to stand up for the rights of blacks as well as women during her culture when that was not a very popular thing to do. Way before, a hundred years before the civil rights movement that we knew it, uh, as being in the 1960s, led by one of the, um, the greatest leaders of their day, and that was Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, she, was, she was the Martin Luther King Jr. of her day before there ever was a Martin Luther King Jr. And, and her story is incredible. And so I'm going to have a, a great privilege this morning of sharing that with you. One of the things that has come up in some of the discussion from others is that all of these stories have been inspiring and people have learned so much about people that they may have heard about in history but never really knew the story of their faith that influenced why their story was so impactful uh, at that time. Um, Truth was born, as I said, Isabella Bomfrey. Uh, she was a slave, uh, Dutch-speaking, um, black American. And so when, um, when she was uh, born in 1797, she was born into a slave's household. And as she grew up, she was bought and sold four different times. And she was subjected to harsh physical labor and violent punishments. Um, she was sold once for $100 in a flock of sheep. And so I, I, I want us to remember the mindset of the culture at this time where slavery was still a very op oppressive um, uh, type, of, uh, type of lifestyle and it, it wasn't even given a second thought and, and all of the slaves were, were not considered human, they were considered property. And, and I think we sometimes lose sight of that because we live in a free world now and we know that even that can be a misnomer. But, um, but over the course of her enslavement, uh, she was beaten, she was subjected to harsh and cruel uh, 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 responsibilities, excuse me, 
uh, but she was also raped and beaten and abused by her masters. Um, she worked hard alongside of the male slaves, uh, oftentimes doing the same work that they were required to do. Um, she married at least twice, possibly three or four times. It, the records uh, do not indicate a, a direct amount, but they do know of two of her marriages. And the problem was is that the marriage, each of her marriages ended in the selling of her husband at that time to another master. You see, in this era, marriages between slaves were not recognized legally. They were unstable and often temporary because the, the mantra was they were united unto death or, to, or unto distance to do them part. And so since these marriages were not acknowledged by law, any children they produced were subject to the whims of their owners. So if, uh, if two slaves were under the same owner, the, uh, the children of that marriage belonged to the owner, not to the uh, husband and wife. Now, if there was a slave under one owner, and uh, the, another slave under another owner, and they produced children, the, there was a, a major problem in finding, you know, in, in, in who owned that child. That is why they did not um, condone uh, slaves from different households mixing in marriage. Um, what they would do immediately if they found out that uh, a couple was together, they would sell one. Uh, or both to different parties to separate them from that happening. Just a very abusive, cruel way of, of, of treating uh, human beings. And so um, this was just the, the, the nature of the day and accepted as a normal practice. But um, today we look at that as being an, an atrocious behavior and how to treat other people. Um, the first thing I want to share with you in regard to her life, and we're going to talk about her life as we talk about these points. And the first thing is that we have to learn that God has a purpose in our pain. Okay, we, we've heard that expression before, that God has purpose in our pain. In other words, God is doing a work uh, in our lives in spite of the situations and circumstances around us where life has come to try to break us. God uses life experiences to build us into the person that he wants us to be. God always has a purpose in the pain in which we're going through. In 1927, um, Sojourner was um, uh, about 20 years old at this time, excuse me, 30 years old at this time. Um, New York passed a law that would emancipate the slaves within its state. And uh, a year before that happened, uh, Sojourner fled her last master with her fifth child. And um, she escaped and ran away to, um, uh, and she met a family, an abolitionist family called the Wagonins. And the Wagonins took her in and purchased her from her uh, old master for $20 uh, because he saw the handwriting on the wall that she was going to be set free anyway. And so rather than take the loss, he took the 20 and he ran. And, and she became the property of the Wagonins who basically set her free. And that is where she gained her freedom at 30 years of age with her youngest child in her arms. The four other children that she bore were still the property of the master who uh, set her free. And so, um, and so she uh, began her life of freedom at the age of 30. And, um, and it wasn't until a year later that her own children regained their freedom, but um, just a very uh, difficult, painful journey for her, especially right at the time where she was um, coming into her own as a, as a free woman. And so she basically um, understood that, um, that she was to be able to uh, do the work that God called her to be. And so um, as, we, as we learn about her life, 
The, the second aspect of her life is that um, we learned that forgiveness had to be a vital part of, the, of who she was to become. So as we said, uh, she had such a difficult, harsh upbringing. Uh, the brutality of, of what she was subjected to, not only physically and personally, but also through her family and through others. Uh, she had four um, uh, brothers and sisters that were sold out from under uh, her family. And so she had these family members that were, that were sold to other masters as well as one of her own children was sold to a, um, a man out of state, which at the time was highly illegal. And so she had to learn how to navigate all this pain and stuff. And through that, God began to do a work in her. And the second aspect of the things I want to focus on is forgiveness is a key element of our journey. Forgiveness has to be a key element of our journey. When the Wagonins um, adopted her, so to speak, and brought her into the family, their profound faith had such a remarkable influence on Sojourner Truth's life that she became a Christian. Uh, she grew up in a spiritual environment uh, with her mom, but she never really fully made a commitment to God uh, until she was set free from her bondage to slavery. And out of that, um, her life began to take on a different direction. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But the problem was, um, as I mentioned earlier, her son Peter was sold to a man in Alabama, which was illegal for any slaves to be, uh, any slave children to be sold outside of state of New York, where she lived. And when that happened, she was so bitter and so angry. The Wagonins helped her uh, uh, through the court of law sue the white slave owner to regain custody of her own son. And in, in the history of the courts, she became the first black woman to sue a white man and win. And so she was reunited with her son um, a year later after he was sold. And, and so through that process, she saw this white family helping her, a black woman, to not only regain her children, but also to regain her life. And it was because of that that she not only became a believer, but um, during this whole time she harbored intense bitterness towards white people. They had caused her and her family so much pain that sometimes she, would, she wished that God would simply just kill them all. However, because of the, the Van Wagenen's uh, benevolence. She began to learn what it meant to love those who had oppressed her, and she felt that only God's supernatural grace enabled her to do this. And for a while, she even used the Van Wagenen's name as her name uh, before she changed it over to Sojourner Truth um, at the age of 46. But uh, this was a testimony to her of love and how that love turned into a, a spirit of forgiveness towards those who had harmed her. Um, she had a couple of quotes um, that basically said, uh, the spirit calls me and I must go. So during this time, she saw herself as called to the mission of um, of dealing with the issue of slavery within the United States as well as the, the, the issue of women's rights, not just black women, but white and black women as well, all women. And, and so this became a, um, a challenge for her to be able to, uh, to do what she felt God had called her to do. She said this, when I left the house of bondage, I left everything behind. I wasn't going to keep nothing of Egypt on me, and so I went to the Lord and asked him to give me a new name. This was in 1843. She was 46 years old at the time. He gave me the name Sojourner because I was to travel up and down the land showing the people their sins and being a sign unto them. I told the Lord I wanted two names because everybody else had two, and he gave me the name Truth. 
because I was to declare the truth to the people. So that's how she became Sojourner Truth, um, going from Isabella Bonfrey to Sojourner Truth. And this is where most people know her, is with this, with this name. So in John chapter 8, verse 32, we're reminded when Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. She just really, truly believed that God had called her to bring the truth of not only the word of God, but the, the, the truth of what it meant to be equal, um, both in race and in, in gender. And again, we're talking the mid 17, excuse me, the mid 1800s, uh, prior to the Civil War, where she was this advocate voice for equality among all people. And this was such a rare entity among a woman, let alone the, you know, the men that were doing this at the time, the, the, the African-American black men that were doing it at the time. She was a rare voice among, among the small voices that were being uh, used at that time. And so in Isaiah chapter 62, um, we're reminded in verses 1, 2, and 3, For Zion's sake, the writer said, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name in the and that the mouth of the Lord will bestow, you will be a crown of splendor in the land, in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. So she believed that the changing of her name was a, um, was a calling of God to bring the truth to a nation that needed to hear the truth, to vindicate all men in all shapes, in all forms, in all races, and, and in all genders, to be able to, uh, to be that voice and to be that uh, wake-up call for our nation to realize just the, the evil that was being portrayed through, through how they were dealing with not only blacks, but also women themselves. You know, along the way in life's journey, this is just a reminder that you're going to get hurt by someone. Somebody will do something either um, irresponsibly, directly or indirectly, we will get hurt. And, and there is no, um, there's, there is absolutely, uh, you know, no one that's going to be exempt from this. We all will get hurt in some way. And we need to learn how to respond to that. Some of us get angry. Some of us get vindictive. Some of us want revenge. Some of us, you know, we we uh, become bitter and she said that we need to learn how to forgive because she saw what that anger and bitterness was doing to her against the whites and then she saw how God's forgiveness opened up a door of healing as well as the power of the message in which she was to bring to our culture and our world at that time and and in Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 we're reminded by Paul that we need to bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. And I love this last part. He says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I don't need to tell you how, how much God's forgiven you of and how God continues to forgive you. This is how we must learn how to forgive one another. And I love that idea of, of how Sojourner Truth was such a uh, powerful force with her testimony and how forgiveness was a very underlying foundation of, of the power of, of, of her message. So the third thing that we need to realize is our world is broken. How many of you could say hey, amen to that? Our world is broken. And there is so much that we've, we've done to try to fix it, but there's so much more that we need to do to continue that process. But all around us, we see the brokenness that this world brings in so many different ways. You know, we're still dealing with racial uh, inequality. We're still dealing with how, how we treat women. We're still dealing with how we um, allow evil to prevail during, during, um, during these, these dark times. 
And let me tell you, it is unnerving for me as a 61-year-old believer to see the change in our culture and in our society and how we have allowed things to just snowball. And it's like, can't anybody see where we are headed as a nation and, and how we are allowing so much of this uh, unnecessary garbage to go on and nobody is taking a stand to, to, um, to stand for equality, to stand for um, people's rights, to stand for the, the hope of, of our salvation in Christ. And so um, all of these things tempered with the idea of, of what God has in store for us in eternity needs to be the focus of us as believers. But our world is broken and we must do what we can to fix it. I truly believe that we are called to social needs in our community, not at the expense of spiritual needs or, or not in um, disregard to spiritual needs or to spiritual truth, but we must learn to take spiritual truth to apply it to a, in a social context. Does that make sense? So I want you to understand this, that we are called to, to bring the gospel to a dying and hurting world. But sometimes the dying and hurting world cannot hear the gospel because of the noise of the social unrest that is in our world today. So I, be, I believe that as believers, we must learn how to navigate the social unrest in order to bring the message of the power of the gospel to a world that is looking for answers and a world that is trying to hear the truth and, and not just a distorted version of the truth or a, a small glimpse of the truth, but the, but the truth that's found in our relationship with God, in the word of God, to bring deliverance and to bring hope and to bring healing to those that are lost and dying in the world. Sojourner True said, religion without humanity is very poor human stuff. Just what I said. If, if we can't figure out how to bring the context of the gospel to the dilemma of the social needs, then we've got a major problem. There is such a disconnect between the church and the world today that the world wants nothing to do with the church because they see nothing relationally within what the church can do for them within the culture in which they're living. I think this is a huge problem that we in the church have got to figure out. But we can do it when we can learn how to navigate how the truth has changed our life and how we can, we can communicate that to others how the truth can change their life and help them in the midst of them trying to find themselves uh, in, in God's plan, the bigger picture in the kingdom of God for where we live within our culture. James chapter 1 verse 27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So people aren't going to know, uh, they don't care how much you know, until they know how much you care. You've heard that before. And so we have to care more than what we uh, show and what we know because we must meet a need before they'll listen to, um, to the answer to that need, if that makes any sense. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to, we have to take care of the social issues and needs that are around us. This is what Sojourner Truth did. She saw the, the, the great social need, the, the void. She, she saw the, the darkness of the, the current social structure, and she spoke out against it, even at great risk to her own life. And, and she, she felt like if this is what God called her to do, then God was going to take care of her, and she didn't have to worry. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, the writer said, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly 
with your God. This is what God wants us to do, to act justly, to, sh to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, Isaiah said, Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. We must be the voice of reason in an unreasonable culture. In an unreasonable society, we have to be the voice of God for people to hear the, the, the truth in how God wants justice allocated in our culture. And I believe that Sojourner Truth was a loud voice in a time of muffled hearing and listening among the, the culture that existed in the United States during its day. You see, she fought for the rights of race and for the rights of gender. And fourth, one of the things that she did was that she trusted even in the face of fear. She said, I feel safe even in the midst of my enemies for the truth is powerful and will prevail. And so one of the things I want you to be really clear about is that all of these stories that we've been telling uh, and talking about fearless faith, these people that just, uh, in, in, in the face of opposition and struggle and challenges, they, they lived out their life with no regret. And, and we, we want to look at them and say, man, they are great examples of fearless faith. But that doesn't mean that they didn't feel fear, that they didn't experience times when they wanted to turn around and run away. You see, these examples of the heroes of the faith, um, they all battled fear at some point and place and time in their lives. But what, what happened? Well, see, fearless faith is learning how to trust God above your fear, obviously. Learning how to trust God above your fear. You see, you have faith and you have trust. And in faith... We, we are believing that God is able to give us the best outcome. And, and our faith is, is what we believe for the best possible results. But it is trust that believes that no matter what happens, whether or not we get the answer to prayer that we want or need, and, and we recognize that even if God doesn't answer our prayer the way that we want him to, or if he answers it all, it is our trust in God that, that gets us through whatever circumstance we are, we are walking out. So there are times when we're believing for the best possible outcome, but we're trusting that even even in the midst of the worst of outcome that could happen, that, that God will still redeem us and redeem that situation for his praise and for his glory. Hebrews chapter 4, we're reminded in the power of what God's word does. Verses 12 to 13, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom we must give an account. So in 1843, when, um, when Sojourner changed her name, and she felt like God had a calling on her life at 46 uh, years old, that she began to uh, go out all across the countryside preaching the word of God. Well, her kids, when they heard this news uh, that their mom was going out and sharing her testimony, they were horrified. How could this poor, illiterate, former slave hope to survive as an itinerant speaker. Women were not supposed to speak publicly during this era, and also as a former slave, uh, she would not be well received. She reassured her family that if, as she believed, the calling was from God, then God would take care of her. And this happened during a, the, uh, this type of thing happened during an event in Ohio 
where she faced an irate throng that stormed the camp meeting one night. And as she hid in the corner of a tent, she feared for her life, shaking with fear uh, as the mob began to uh, con convene on to the, uh, the tent that she was in. Uh, but her faith revived and she overcame her fear and she realized that she was God's child and it was his business to protect her as long as she was doing what he called her to do. Isn't that amazing? To have that amount of faith and trust in God. So she gathered her courage. She was able to get outside and she climbed on a hill overlooking the area that was just in total disarray. And she began to sing. She was known for not only her speaking ability, she was a very good speaker, but she had a beautiful singing voice. And as they were fighting it out down below her, she began to sing. And the mob stopped and they, they turned on her. And again, she cried out, why are you coming at me with clubs and sticks? I'm not going to hurt anyone. And this is what the crowd said. They yelled, we ain't going to hurt you, old woman. We just came to hear you sing. You see, even in the midst of that difficult situation, she trusted God. She began to use her gifts that God had given to her, speaking and singing. And God began to turn the heart of these people to hear her message. And her message began to gain traction. Even among the messages that were being brought by Frederick Douglass and others who were, who were advocating abolition, and, and again, this is um, almost 20 years, about 15 years before the, um, the Civil War. The, this is what began to cause the stirring of the nation to really take a second hard look at the issue of slavery. And it began to turn the heart of the people towards setting the, the slaves free. And, and her voice rang just as loud, if not louder, than some of these other voices. And not only that, because many of these uh, men who were advocating for abolition among the slaves were also advocating for the rights of a black slave man to vote. And, and she basically said, well, what about the women? And that gave her another platform in which to advocate the, the equal rights among not just the black slave, but also the white and black woman as well. And this was an incredible uh, transformation for her as well as for the, the nation to be able to hear from a female perspective. She said this, Life is a hard battle anyway, and if we laugh and sing a little as we fight the good fight of freedom, it makes it all go easier. I will not allow my life's light to be determined by the darkness around me. I will not allow my life's light to be determined by the darkness around me. She was going to thrive in the midst of her situation and allow Jesus in the midst of the darkness to allow his light to shine bright. And that just reminds me of a scripture in Matthew chapter 5 where it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so I just love the idea that um, her life as, a, and as an example of her faith, because it was her faith that motivated her to want to see the changes made in culture. It was her relationship with Jesus where she learned how to forgive, where she learned how to use her giftings, where she learned how to use her, her, her voice to advocate change for the, the culture around her. So in 1863, right before she died, um, at 86 years old, uh, she, she said this. Um, excuse me. Um, 
She was 66 years old, I'm sorry. And she said, children, who made your skin white? Was it not God? Well, who made mine black? Was it not the same God? Am I to blame, therefore, because my skin is black? Does not God love colored children as well as white children? And did not the same Savior die to save the one as well as the other? And so she was using this idea of reasoning to basically advocate the fact that we were all one. And when Abraham Lincoln, who invited Sojourner Truth to the White House, Abraham Lincoln advocated um, for the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, and it was, the, it was the issue of ordering that all men be created, or all men who are created equal would be, would be free, not only in the eyes of God, but also in the nation moving forward. And that's what motivated many to, to jump on the, um, the, the bandwagon, so to speak, uh, maybe not the best use of words, but just the, the whole motivation and drive to see the, uh, the institution of slavery being banned uh, in, our, in our country during that time. Well, she was well into her 60s when the Civil War broke out, but what did she do? She advocated for the supplies for, for the uh, black regiments that were created within the Civil War. She advocated for black men to step up and volunteer to fight for their own freedom and to be a presence within the Union Army. Again, as I said, she met Abraham Lincoln in 1864. She was a counselor in the National Freedmen's Association for a year, helping emancipated slaves to get established in the, the work world so that they could begin earning a living for themselves and for their families. Uh, she worked for a time uh, on a goal of special Western settlement for the, for the freed slaves from the government as well. Uh, she was a teacher and a lecturer after the war, and when she retired uh, in 1883, she passed away shortly afterwards at the age of 80, 86 years old. And what an incredible life uh, that she lived, and just reminding us as we learn all of these stories that yes, life is filled with challenges, setbacks, and opposition, but it was their faith that made the difference and, and how they handled the difficulties of their day and allowed their testimony to make a difference in the lives of those around them. So as we close this morning, I just want to encourage you. What is it that you're going through? What is God trying to, uh, to shape in your life through the different obstacles, the different struggles, the different setbacks that you may be facing? Life is filled with challenges. Uh, there's, there's just no way around it. And, and how are you going to handle them? Who are you going to allow to walk with you and handle them? In all these stories and all these illustrations, we'll see how these individuals allowed the Spirit of God to, to change their life. And each and every situation, they, they looked to God for calling. And they looked to God for a way in which to say, God, how can I make a difference? God, how can I change my culture because of my relationship with you? I truly believe as believers, we allow our culture to beat us down. We allow our culture to shape us and mold us when in turn it should be us that's stepping up, us that is standing out, us that is, that is stepping out in faith believing that God wants to use us to make a difference. How different our world would be if believers would begin to see the hand of God on their life, not to be overshadowed by culture, but to be a light in the midst of culture to bring change and to bring healing and to bring hope as well. We can do this. We can do this if only we would say, God, here am I, send me. God, here am I, use me. Would you be willing to say that today? Would you be willing to walk that out in your life today? Let me pray with you because I truly believe there are some of you that are holding back. There are some of you that have been downtrodden and beaten down and, and your struggle is very real. But let me tell you what, we serve a God 
who is more powerful than anything that is holding you down. We serve a God that is greater than any obstacle that you're facing right now. We serve a God that wants to to use you to transform the culture around you. And even if that culture was only one person, one, one moment, one situation, don't miss on the opportunity that God has to make a difference through you. Father, we just pray for those that are watching us today and listening to this message. Father God, we are praying that, that we would not allow culture to define and to, and to shape us, but God, that we would be the, the, the culture changers that you have called us to be, the life changers that you have called us to be. God, help us. We may not know what it looks like. We may be overwhelmed by even the very thought of what it might look like. But God, I pray that we would learn to just trust you, that you have raised us up and called us to make a difference where you have placed us. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 May God bless you as we uh, close out the rest of our service this morning with a final worship song. It is my prayer that, that these messages have challenged you, these messages have helped you in your journey with him. And uh, if there's any way that we can help you, please let us know. You can text to that number, 408-547-4911, your prayer request or your, your need, and we would love to come alongside of you to, to help you. If you're willing to be a game changer, a life changer, uh, please let us know that as well. God, I want to get in. Throw me in, God. Throw me in the game. Put me in the game, Lord. Help me to be the, the game changer that I need to be, and that you called me to be in life. God bless you. Have a great week in him. Without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Please from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was ransomed He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have been. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. 
darkness rejoiced, so heaven had gone. But then Jesus arose with all freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes Oh, yeah.